I'd like to welcome everybody today to the, uh, the UCSD CTRI KL2 seminar series on writing as if your life, academic life, depended upon it. We are filming today because uh, some of our members are away and we're talking about uh, a topic of abiding interest to us all, and that is grant writing. Um, the uh, Gary Firestein will be talking about industry-funded grants and uh, procedures. I'll be talking about uh, RO1 type grants, and Dilip Jesty will be talking about K type grants or career grants. I suspect there will be a great deal of overlap uh, amongst the the three areas because at its heart grant writing has to focus on clarity, succinctness, and telling a story. Now the matrix that you tell, the matrix that you use for telling that story will differ subtly. But um, Gary, would you like to begin? I would be delighted to. Okay. But what I'm going to talk about is how to uh, engage and obtain funding from uh, the private sector, particularly uh, industry, uh, industry sources. And the issue uh, um, is, of course, that in today's world, traditional funding sources such as uh, the NIH or foundations and so on um, are still providing considerable resources for people to perform their research, but uh, they are cons much more limited than they were several years ago. So with funding rates in the 10 percentile range, it really becomes, uh, in some cases, more of a lottery where uh, great grants don't get funded. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I focused on early in my career was to have a portfolio of funding sources that included not only federal agencies but also um, uh, industry supported uh, industry supported research. Now there is in some academic circles something of a bias against the industry funded research. Uh, and uh, that is uh, um, something that we simply have to get over uh, because uh, there is very good science being done in industry. They are interested in innovative and creative ideas and looking for ways, to uh, support uh, their own programs using yet ex uh, uh, extramural uh, interactions. And there are, uh, the other thing about uh, industry is that uh, in the 1970s, it was sort of a uh, place for people to go that couldn't make it in academics. But that really tr changed dramatically uh, in the 1980s with the biotech revolution. And many of the best and the brightest people uh, went into the private sector. And these are very smart people that have unbelievable technology uh, uh, and uh, quite, a, quite a bit of money sometimes or quite a few resources in order to support uh, research. So what is it that you are looking for? Well, uh, number one is funds to support great science. Uh, I also think that being less dependent on federal funds uh, and grants, uh, traditional grants, is useful in order to get us have a diversified portfolio. You're also uh, trying to avoid um, dependence on again, the sort of random walk that can sometimes occur in study sections. You need salary support and you need publications. So what does, what does industry want? What does a scientist at a biotech company or pharma want? Well, their number one priority is to develop drugs or diagnostics and for their company ultimately to make money. That is different from an academic's perspective, but there is an overlap in the Venn diagram that can place both of you in the same place at the same time. They're looking for results that help validate therapeutic targets as long as, in the end, that helps them ultimately to get a drug developed and then they can make money. They want to move a compound towards development again, which is what helps make a company money in the long run. But most important, a champion at the company is essential, um, and the champion gets vicarious pleasure from doing good science. So in some ways, um, 
we are uh, envious of people in industry because they have so many uh, resources at their disposal, but they are envious of academics because we get to choose what, uh, what programs, research programs we want to work on, pick our collaborators, uh, and it is our choice. And so this gives someone in, uh, in industry really an opportunity to branch out into other areas in a way that they wouldn't be able to with an intramural program. So uh, why do they want to work with you? Well, you have to remember that uh, most of these folks is, are very smart uh, and have quite a bit of resources, and they can typically do everything that you can do except better, faster, with better equipment. What do we have that they don't have? Number one is patients and clinical samples. They, they have great science, they have lots of equipment, but they do not have access to biological samples or well -fed. Uh, we oftentimes have unique assays or imaging modalities, uh, animal models uh, that they can't set up, especially in small companies, uh, and also intellectual property. And we can talk more about that later. The other thing is, as expensive as you, as you think you may be, you are less expensive than an intramural program at a company. The average FTE, at least several years ago, the last time I looked at it, at a company cost fully loaded including benefits, supplies, and so on, is about $300,000 a year. And I can promise you that whatever it is that, they, that you ask them to do, that, you, that they ask you to do, it will cost less, even if you throw in indirect costs and uh, benefits and so on. So, uh, so typically, um, if, if you have a project that requires hiring one full FTE, you can imagine uh, that if you are you can bring it in for less than $300,000. They're actually getting a bargain by working with you. And, and in addition to that, they get your intellectual input. So let's talk about a couple of specific things. One is providing clinical samples. Now, this is something that we're commonly asked about. Biobanking, uh, providing samples, is becoming increasingly common. And uh, in, in biotech companies and farming, their eyes light up when we talk about unique patient samples. So just remember that you must have appropriate consent. Don't underestimate the cost. We always underestimate how much we're worth and how much effort it actually goes into obtaining, cataloging samples, storing them, managing them, and so on. Don't forget uh, that you need, to, you can't just uh, put the samples in your pocket and carry it over there. There has to be a material transfer agreement or some sort of licensing agreement. And the discoveries typically belong to the company. They don't belong to you. So that's actually one of the least satisfying types of intellectual uh, relationships. But when I do this, I almost, it's almost always part of a broader agreement where we want to see the data there that they're obtaining so that we can be active collaborators in a research program. And that often will spin off a number of projects that you can participate in. And it is very important to try to include this as part of a scientific collaboration rather than simply providing uh, sam uh, clinical samples. Um, so that's biological samples. Performing unique assays. Um, unique assays are not, are not a trade secret. It's actually better if you publish them so that there's a track record behind them and so that you can go to, uh, to folks and then discuss it and show how it's validated. Um, in contrast, if you keep it a secret, they're not going to, or the methods, uh, you keep those methods a secret, they're not going to be terribly useful to them. Even if you tell them how to do it and you hand them the protocols, it's still easier and less expensive for you to do it for them. So, so if you have some sort of unique procedure or assay, uh, it, it, it has, again, great value. It can be even some interesting qPCR techniques or ELISAs or other immunoassays, these are the sorts of things that companies are looking for so that they don't have to set this up themselves. Animal models are also very common, especially with small companies. Small companies typically don't have a vivarium, they don't have the expertise locally, and they have a choice of either going to a contract lab, uh, which basically will simply ask for the protocol, and then they run the, sample, the, the, the experiment, and then regurgitate the data back to the sponsor, or doing something in academia where the individual running the assay may have some specialized expertise and a deeper understanding of disease pathogenesis and can provide some additional information. So it is 
so you have to remember that you are competing with these private companies, uh, but you have something that they can offer. And when I look at the cost structures, by and large, we can do better than most of the private, than some of these private uh, contract research organizations. Um, what about uh, intellectual property? Just remember that your uh, discoveries have value, and they have value as to companies. If you have discovered something, there's a simple process for filing a disclosure. The technology transfer will review that and talk to you about whether or not this is something that is patentable um, uh, or should be protected. And then once you do that, intellectual property becomes, again, a saleable commodity that can be used to, to bring a, a sponsor to you and will allow you then to set up a collaboration, uh, a collaboration with them. Um, so the last thing I have on one slide is, is the benefits of being nice. So um, you, it is very important to be nice to people um, in, in industry and develop personal relationships. Um, that is, uh, in industry people play musical chairs. The person at Merck this year is at Pfizer next year, is at Biogenetic the next year. If you're not nice to them, they will remember it and they will talk to their friends. If you're very nice and you're very accommodating, it's actually amazing uh, how that can evolve ultimately into, into an agreement. And I can tell you, uh, this is at meetings too, by the way. So you have a poster session, you, know, you want to talk to people, be open, be collaborative. And it doesn't pay off immediately, but over a period of time, it really does work. And I now, you know, I'm at the point, for instance, where people that I've talked to or met over the years, they will contact me and they'll say, hey, listen, we have a project that's going on. If you can send me a protocol or an idea within the next week, uh, you know, I think we can come up with, you know, X number of dollars to support. And it's like uh, mana from heaven all of a sudden, uh, uh, new, uh, new funding for these, uh, for these projects. So uh, you need to develop personal relations relationships and, and, you, and, and that is ultimately leads to identifying a champion who can help you get your program and project started. Stay in close contact at, over the years. Um, you'll learn something from, uh, from the, these people and, uh, and they will come back to you if you have something to offer them and it can be, it can be beneficial either intellectually or in terms of a research agreement later on. The last thing is, uh, oftentimes people will come to you with a very small project that could potentially lead to a larger one, and I would take advantage of that, even if in some cases it's a lost meter. They want to see that you can do something that you can produce. They're not interested in a typical academic random walk. This is goal-oriented research. They want to test you out, see if you can do what you say you're going to do, and then they will come back to you uh, with, uh, uh, with more, uh, with a larger uh, proposal. So what types of projects are there? They have the clear goals and timelines. This is not like writing an NIH grant. It is not science for science sake. There can be great science involved, but it is goal-oriented, and the goal is almost always validating a target, testing a therapeutic agent, developing and validating a diagnostic. Industry is driven by results, and so you have to agree, whatever you agree to, you have to do in a timely fashion. I mean, you can, if you don't, if you don't do it, you know, you'll be okay with this time, but you won't be the next time. And you have to live up to your promises. This is not a grant where you can change directions. You can't suddenly say, oh, I was going to measure these two genes, but I changed my mind because I thought these two looked more interesting. And then people are left wondering, you know, you know, their bosses are then wondering where the results are. Um, there are... Um, multiple types of funding vehicles. There's research agreements that is a, essentially a contract with the university and it comes with indirect cost rates, the same as an NIH grant, 55%. So if, they, if you have $100,000 of work that you want to do, it costs the company $155,000. There are recharge services that you can do. There with the company, it makes the indirect cost rate at a minimum of 45%. And then the last is as a service agreement, which is a lab service agreement. We'll talk more about that later. But there, the indirect cost rate is in the 10 to 15 percent range. 
the most important thing is that you and the company want the same thing, which is the most bang for buck. You want most, the most money possible going to your direct research costs. That is not necessarily what the university wants. The university is interested in indirect costs. So if something is really a service agreement, you have an assay, the company wants you to do the assay for them, rather than a research program, uh, then it is highly beneficial to you to set it up as a service agreement if you meet certain fixed, certain criteria. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So the discovery program at the University of California or University, yeah, they offer this discovery joint collaborative program. Yes. What type of um, vehicle is this on the vehicle? Uh, those are, the question. yeah, so the question relates to the UC discovery program, mm -hmm. which is a matching grant program um, that uh, if, you, if you have a California company uh, that you sign a research agreement with, it's not a service agreement, it's an actual research agreement, the University of California will match that uh, amount of money. And, and so what that actually also does is it cuts <coughs> the indirect cost rate indirectly in half. So if, you, if company A puts up $100,000 for direct costs, it really costs them $150,000. University puts in another hundred thousand dollars, so then the actually the indirect they don't have to pay indirect costs on that part. So it is a great way of a company, a local company, uh, leveraging uh, uh, leveraging their funds, and a number of people have, have done that here. Um, the key is it's got to be California. Typically, it's a small company, and there has to be a key a, a clear plan to go from basic research to some sort of therapeutic target uh, in a way that ultimately increases California employment, because that's, that's, that's really the goal of the program. Are they looking for sort of patent agreements then with, with the company, or is that... No, actually, uh, the, it's, it's, it's written and scored just like an NIH grant, but through peer review, as opposed to a company grant, pure company grant, where it's evaluated by, internally by them, and they just say, yes, we want to fund it, or no, we don't want to fund it. So you write a grant, and it doesn't have to include any University of California intellectual property. In fact, most most companies won't do it if right. if it's if they lose control of their own uh, IP intellectual property. Um, and so the university is quite open with that. They're not seeking to increase their patent portfolio. What they're seeking to do is bring research agreements into the into the into the university and jobs in the state. My understanding of this program is like the best option for more junior investigators because <clears throat> it's peer review, so it's more about merit of the science. But with big companies, let me let me stop you on there. You should that you're making the assumption that an industry related grant is not based on merit. And I and I, and I don't actually agree with that. Industry grants, are bad grants, bad proposals, don't get funded. They are actually, they, they, they pay a steeper price for a failed project than any uh, federal or foundation grant that I've, that I've seen. But they typically seek after those opinion leaders of the field that they're interested in. And of course, if you are viewed by the industry as opinion leaders, you're already very senior, very established. So that, I, I didn't mean to say that they don't care about merits, but they definitely would invest in people who <coughs> it's safe for them to invest in rather than people who are just starting out with less experience. Right, so, so the question is, how do you get started? And, and I don't want to eat up everybody's time, so I'll, I'll, I'll be short, but I'm almost done here. Um, uh, you have to be proactive, and junior people can also get and develop relationships with uh, with companies and develop collaborations. It is true that at this point, in, for instance, a senior investigator's career, uh, there can be quite a bit of uh, you know, sort of spontaneous contacts, and, you know, either for consultation or for research agreements or collaborations. But if you're standing in front of a poster um, at a, at your national meetings, you would be surprised how many people come up and talk to you. And, and you should be, or if you're going around and seeing their posters, because they'll have posters as well. So if you are proactive, you can start developing things. And, I, and there are many junior investigators that have agreements with 
both big companies and small companies. But you're right, it takes, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a couple of years of, of going out and meeting people and talking to people to develop the relationships so that you can then subsequently have some sort of a research agreement. UC Discovery is no easier than that, by the way, because the first step in UC Discovery is you have to have a company that's interested in investing in you. Because without, because you, you don't just apply to UC Discovery. The first thing that happens is a company says, I want to do a project with you. And then most of the time what happens is you say to them, this is a great project. I can leverage your money by going to UC Discovery. And, and, and so typically, you're, you know, that, that idea comes from, from, the, from the faculty. Um, so let me, uh, I'm not going to talk, I, I had a section here on, on deal terms and, and how you close them. But the only thing I wanted to mention is that you should track the progress of any agreement carefully through the university. It tends to get lost in a big stack of a thousand other faculty members that are all trying to do things. And don't feel bad about calling the person in the Office of Contracts and Grants many times to make sure you're on top of their uh, on top of your proposal. Um, because if you wait long enough, the people that you're dealing with will go to another company. <laughs> and you have to start over. And this has happened innumerable times to people. So, so you have to strike while the iron is hot. Um, uh, final points. You need to remember when you're dealing with companies, uh, including if you have consulting relationships, that you work for the university. You do not work for the company. Um, and, and sometimes the company forgets this, uh, but you have to rem remind them, you, you, you don't work for them. Um, you may have to have some flexibility on the timing of publication. Uh, the uh, companies have a different view of what's important in terms of publication and why you publish. It's generally to support a program or a compound as opposed to you, because you want to uh, support your own academic uh, um, uh, advancement. If you have a unique reagent that's from a company, it doesn't really hurt you very much to delay publication a little bit because no one else is going to have that reagent uh, either. Um, but you, you have a right to publish early, but it's best to discuss publication strategies in advance with companies so that you can have a, a mutual agreement and that it works out in, in both your interests. Uh, and use the data that you generate with discretion. This is the company's crown jewels. We're at a public university, but the data that's generated, especially from a, a service agreement, belongs to the company in, in, in many ways. And uh, it is, it is uh, something that they jealously guard. So you always need to make sure you're, you show some discretion when you're talking to other people about industry interactions, industry data, because they uh, they want that data to be revealed in a way that is consistent with their uh, with their goals. So that's it for at least industry uh, uh, industry agreements. Thank you, Gary. But before we move on, uh, let's let's take a few minutes if there are some other questions. Uh, I have kind of a practical question. If you're getting, so I actually like the idea of a having a, a diverse portfolio of, of funding agencies. Um, but if you're getting salary support from industry, how does that impact, or does it impact at all your academic appointment schedule? Not, not at all, because remember, the, the, the grants are treated like the university, very, or, or very much like any, any federal grant. In other words, they'll, it, it collects, the money is not awarded to you personally, it's awarded to the university. And if you have 10% effort in the grant, that 10% goes directly to your Know, to your salary, just like just like any other brand. I have a, any comments on how investigators can reduce the conflict of interest um, in terms of both disclosure and in terms of their own research work outside the industry? Yes, conflict of interest. I had there's a couple of slides on that as a whole discussion in and of itself. But the, the sort of short form of that is that. Um, there's a conflict of interest committee that reviews uh, reviews these agreements and your relationship with companies, and uh, they provide really the 
strategy by which you can go forward. The, the simplest agreements, of course, are ones where you have no conflict of interest. You're just somebody who's coming to you. But in some cases, you, uh, you may be consulting for a company. And then, in fact, typically, you will be, the company will come to you for some consultation. And then they'll then want to do a research agreement with them. And you have several choices. You can either terminate the consulting agreement, and that is the cleanest way. Um, the other way is to make sure that the statement of work for the consulting activities is distinct from the research statement of work. So, for example, statement of work consulting is design of clinical trials uh, based on, you know, for X, Y, or Z therapeutic target. Statement of work for the research agreement is profiling compound X in a mouse model of something. Those are non-overlapping and clearly distinct. It's not always quite that simple, and that's where conflict of interest comes in. Values. There are certain cases that are now forbidden. For instance, service agreements. You cannot be a consultant and have a service agreement at the same time. Um, if you own more than 15% or you have some ownership stake, then that raises all kinds of other all kinds of other issues. There are ways to mitigate that, such as by having an ad hoc board that reviews your work periodically, or by having, um, or, or by having somebody else serve as the principal investigator. Can you comment on the differences in the time course of getting funding through industry as opposed to NIH? It's always struck me as real different. Uh, well, it's irregularly irregular, actually. <laughs> So you, you pretty much know what the calendar is for uh, for industry for, for for the NIH. You know you know when the, the when the dates are. You know when they're going to be reviewed. And in a normal time when we have budgets, federal budgets, we know about when they'll be funded and when you know what the payment is. So so you know it's going to take you from the time you first decide to submit a grant. It might take 12 to 18 months before money shows up. If all goes well, that's kind of typical. For, uh, for industry, it can be as fast as a month or as long as forever. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you know, for instance, I uh, had uh, one uh, last year that I was working with a company and uh, on a particular target. It was a very interesting compound and we, had some, we set up a nice uh, <coughs> uh, proposal. And then came the holidays and things kind of slowed down, and then they killed the program. So that was an example of why delaying meant never. Um, and then, I, but I would say, in general, you're talking about you know three three months, six months. So it is faster in general. But but that doesn't include the year of developing relationships that goes on before. What always struck me is that you you tend to learn rather quickly from industry if there's interest, but that the negotiations may drag on and on and on. And, and so you could well wind up with a nine-month gestation just by the time you're dealing with, with the university, but, but you at least have that preliminary go sign, maybe a month into it, that you would never get from NIH. Yeah, it, it oftentimes, it, it often requires multiple tiers of approvals. Um, so it's, so a month would be great. My experience is that sort of the, the three months while it, while it percolates through all the different committees that have to approve of things, but it's not a year. Um, and then negotiations between the company and the university can sometimes be problematic in terms of intellectual property, publication rights, and, you know, payments, indirect costs, all those things. Um, but you know, by and large, if you are you know keep the pressure on contracts and grants and and make sure that you know the company's not asking for anything extraordinary, uh, you know, you can you can bring the sides together. If it goes on more than six months, it's not going to happen. Just back to her question about how you get started. Like, you know, we have so many companies here in La Jolla 
and it, it'll read, for example, that they're partnering with Andy Anderson or some other university out there for tissue and things. And how do you sort of get the word out to them that you're you know, here, we have the ability to make that kind of resource available to them? And the proximity of us is, is so advantageous to them. Um, Does the university ever host things for, for faculty and industry? Well, we, we, are, we have been developing more global relationships with a number of companies. So yeah, I don't know if you read last week, we announced the one with Pfizer. And then there was one with Roche that was announced about one or two months ago. Um, we, we don't have right now a sort of way station where, where you can sort of, for lack of a better term, put your wares up. Uh, but um, the CTRI uh, is developing a biorepository. And the notion is that we would, we're, we actually are looking for affiliated biorepositories that we can post on the website. The owner of the repository still maintains control over it but it provides access for people to go, because nobody knows what's out there. Most companies don't. And this is a way that we can, we can then send sort of blast emails out to companies through Connect or Biocom or something like that, once we have that set up. So for instance, I have a, an arthritis repository that has a couple thousand samples in it, you know, a couple thousand patients in it. Well, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I just looked at it yesterday. We have 300 synovial fluids, and. 1,500 blood samples from patients with various forms of arthritis and a couple of hundred synovial tissues from surgeries. Um, uh, but, uh, and I, and so I am, since I am in the CTRI, I am delighted to uh, post that and take advantage of the informatic support. And then what I, what I would like is for, instead of me trying to wait you know, uh, trying to go out and try to find people individually or companies individually. I'd like for them to get to me through the, you know, through the, uh, you know, through that website. And do they ever help you set up the biorepository? I mean, would they ever say, boy, we'd really like to have, say, a colorectal cancer repository? You mean, you mean, would companies help you set yeah, up? Yeah, help, help develop it at the university. Yeah, that, boy, there's a... I've flung myself off that cliff so many times with companies. I think the best way to think of it is if you build it, they will come. Um, and, and companies are not typically interested in helping you develop a repository. That's just why, one of the reasons why when you, once you have it, you should realize how valuable it is. Okay. Well, using your analogy about diversified portfolios to support research. Um, Dilip, do you want to tell us a bit about career grants and what that portfolio is like? Hi, hi everybody. Um, so, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to spend first few minutes talking about research career in general. As Joel said, that there will be overlap. Um, between um, what we will be presenting. Uh, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about the issues in general um, of importance to young investigators. And then I want to focus specifically on k award, especially in terms of the review criteria and how you can maximize your chances of getting a K. So I used to say that research is a marathon. Um, now I modify that by saying this is a marathon, but with multiple sprints from time to time. For example, there are grand deadlines. Uh, there's a deadline for submission of an abstract for a conference, um, a deadline for submitting your academic review to the university. And uh, so it's both a marathon and a sprint. So there are some personal as well as environmental ingredients for success in academic career. The, Personal ingredients. I think the most important is passion. You, you should really like what you are doing. You know, I mean, as senior people will tell you, I mean, we complain from time to time about these deadlines and production and funding and so on. And yet, by and large, most of the time, we like what we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this business. Uh, anything that's work becomes boring, taxing, 
exhausting, anything that is play is fun. So, it's nice if one can make research the fun. It's like you can't really wake up, can't wake, wake up in the morning and see what the results of your experiment were. Then that means that you are cut out to be a researcher. But passion is not enough. Uh, I say that writing skills are almost as important as scientific skills. Uh, because in science we communicate and communicate mostly through writing. The two main vehicles are papers and grants and they strictly depend on what is written. And the writing skills, some people are born with writing skills, other people can develop them. There are courses, there are books, but it's really important if you are serious in being a researcher to learn to write and enjoy writing. Basic knowledge of statistics and methodology is also critical. One does not need to be a statistician, but you should know when to use which statistics. Another thing to remember, especially for a young investigator, is that doing a research project does not mean getting four different experts, one in brain imaging, one in genetics, one in clinical trials, one in statistician, and developing a project. That really won't work. What will work is if you know something about each of those areas. Obviously, you can't be expert in all of them, but you've got to know yourself. Something about imaging, something about genetic, something about trial, if you're able to improve that in your project. And last but not least is uh, keep it simple. Um, often the issue I find is that people are so interested in so many ideas and when they write a proposal there are 100 different questions they want to answer and that really doesn't work. Just think about one question that you can answer. Once you answer then move on to the second question. So those are the personal ingredients of success. What about the environment? These are also important. Where you work? The first is feasibility. Um, whatever project you have in mind can it be done where you are? For example, if you are interested in working on, say, some genetic disorders in children, VA is not the place to work. There is no pediatrics at VA. So, find out the right place, a uh, place that has the right kind of expertise. Mentors are really one of the most critical elements of success for almost for anybody, but especially for a junior investigator. Uh, the mentors come in different sizes and shapes. There are some mentors who are mentors in your area of work, imaging expert, for example, genetic expert. But you also need mentors who are interested in your career. So those will be helpful in terms of process of developing into an independent academic faculty member. Uh, you know, we spend more of our awake time or alert time at work than even at home. So it is important that you surround yourself with people you like to work with. If you hate your colleagues, you should move to another place. So it's really important to have peer group that uh, has shared value system. Whatever value system is there is shared. And if you think about research, I mean, in our grants, they don't always get funded. Papers can sometimes get rejected. So the long-term outcomes can take a while. You need to have some positive reinforcement in between. If the IRB approves a project, huh, that, that's a reason for opening a champagne bottle, for example. Okay. One thing, thinking about grants is, grants are, you know, people use the word grant sponsorship in a, a derogatory way. I don't think about it that way. It's really skills and looking at grants. And the, one way to look at it is that grants are products to be sold and brought. People often come and say, oh, I'm so interested in working in this area and I'm going to write a grant. Well, the problem is, is the person or the agency that's going to fund it, are they interested in this topic? It is like my saying that, say, I can do water pens and that's why I'm going to sell water pens, but if the buyer wants an oil, he or she is not going to buy the water print. So, what you are interested in is fine, but that's not enough. So, you need to find out what the buyer wants. So, it's important to 
get more information about whether it is NIH uh, and the talk to the program officer, foundations talk to uh, their officer, as Gary was saying, it is industry, talk to the industry folks and find out what they want and see if he has something that they will like. The progressive steps in developing any research project, the first is uh, choosing the topic, topic that's of interest to you and potential buyer. One must start with a very comprehensive literature review. Uh, you got to be the last word on that subject. Small subject. It's not the whole disease entity, but the specific thing that you are looking at, you really got to be, you should know more than the reviewers work. Then you should do a pilot study uh, for feasibility and you need to have methodology consultation, statistician, methodology early part of the work rather than after the work is done and you go to them for analysis, that's too late. Uh, you should uh, present your work someplace, preferably publish it before you write a time. Why? Not only because it is good for your CV, but because you get comments from the reviewers. Uh, when you present, then you get comments from the listeners. When you submit it for publication, you get the reviews back. They are very helpful when you prepare the grant proposal. Um, discussing with the NIH program officer early is very really important. So you don't waste your lot of time preparing a proposal and then the program officer says, well, this is not an area of interest to us. Then you design a larger study and write a grant. So, so that's the general comment that could apply to almost anything. So coming back to coming to K, I think K award is one of the best things that NIH does. I mean, just imagine that the taxpayers are giving you 75% of your salary for the next five years without having anything at the very beginning. It's really remarkable and the whole goal is not necessarily you will do a project but that you will develop into an independent investigator. Just think about that. So I think this is a remarkable thing that NIH does. Uh, I don't think anybody else does anything like that. People do it for a shorter period, but not for five years. Uh, and this is really for training in new areas. I mean, you have expertise in some area, and then you develop expertise in additional area. So the goal is you become type of scientist that unique to the university. That per se. For example, you may combine genetic and brain imaging expertise in children with autism. Okay. And you'll be the only person that kind of expert. Um, and the K award includes some funds for doing the study. Uh, to the amounts vary by the NIH Institute or Center. There are different types of K awards. Uh, I was actually impressed that there are something like uh, 15 different types of K, and you don't need to know all of them. Some that are common is first is K01, which is Mentor Research Scientist Development Award. Uh, more basic science oriented. K08 is uh, more clinical science oriented. Uh, K23 is patient oriented research career development award. K24 is for more senior people, associate professor level people who already had a K. Now they have moved from being independent investigator to independent mentors. So, these days, with the reduced funding, these uh, awards are actually are in trouble. Um, the one that NIH loves, and the hardest to get, is the last one, K99. Here, typically in a K award, you would not be expected to write an RO1 till fourth or fifth year. K99, you are supposed to write a K in the second year of your funding. So you really need to be way beyond the regular K award, in the sense you already are typically say MD, PhD, and you already have 30 publications, um, and you are ready to write a K, but not quite there. Yeah. Then I want to spend the remaining time uh, on the review criteria, and the review criteria are for candidate, career development plan, research plan, uh, mentor, and the environment. So, the candidate, what the reviewers are looking for are, do you have a potential for an evidence of commitment to developing 
into an independent and productive research. Now, how do they know that you have the potential for that? Your CV. And what do they look at in the CV? Most important these publications. Peer reviewed publication. That's one currency of academics that holds across the world. And there's really you no know, minimum number of papers that you should have when you write a K, but I would say anything less than double figures is not worth going these days. I mean, you should have at least a dozen publications, peer review. Not all of them you will be first author on, but you could be first author on say half of them, and at least some of them should be in the area you are applying for. If you are not there, it is better to wait and get those publications before you uh, apply. Uh, high quality of academic clinical research record. So in addition, what helps is if you are a reviewer for several journals, uh, you are given presentations, if you have some awards, all of those things help. Uh, you need letters of reference from at least three well-established scientists. In the old days, people really didn't bother so much about the letter. And it's just one paragraph later from some famous person would do. These days, they actually look at those letters. So, most of the letters are written by the awardees themselves. So, you prepare a draft, send it. That's the secret, but everybody knows that. So, you prepare a draft, send it to the, and then they would do that. So, the more detailed it is, the better it is. So, this should be at least a two page letter which talks about how the senior scientist knows you and how uh, he or she thinks you are the best person. Career plan, uh, they are looking at the likelihood that you will really be a successful researcher. So the career plan typically means you are getting some courses or seminars or other training in areas you are, in which you are not an expert. So you already are expert, let's say in imaging but don't know much about genetics. And so then you would go to Boston, so take a course that takes a month, work with some other mentor at, in another place. Um, everybody, I would say most people need training in biostatistic data management. So that's helpful. Bioethics, uh, again, everybody, it's good to mention that uh, special training will be getting. Uh, and there should be adequate plan for monitoring and evaluating the success. Um, here at UCSD, we have Peggy Weingarten. She is an assistant dean for evaluation. And she's really terrific in preparing what are called logic model for judging the success of any grant. So I would say go to her or somebody like her, and then they prepare a really beautiful looking model which has uh, the goals objective, short-term outcome, long-term outcome, and then one can really trace whether the program succeeds or not by using those concrete criteria. The research plan. Now, you are supposed to have a project. Everybody says that the project is really not important. What is important is your career development. And it's really a pilot project. Don't listen to them because the reviewers, they always love to focus on the research plan. Why? Because this is what they are all good at, uh, empirical research. So, when you submit a proposal, which is a part of that K-award, then they will say, oh, the sample size is not enough, there is, we haven't done power analysis, or uh, the recruitment is biased, or the retention, the strategies are not there, so on and so forth. Almost always the biggest criticism is for the research plan. So make sure that you run it by a bunch of people uh, and it is as good as it can be. It can never be perfect because of the page limit, but still try to do your best. Mentors, uh, one mentor is never enough. Uh, so you need at least, but you need one principal mentor and several secondary mentors. Some can be local, some can be outside. And as I said, some mentors would be in the specific areas of work, but you need one career mentor. And that should preferably be the primary mentor, who will make sure that you get promotion, you get papers, you get presentation, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
this letters from mentors again need to be very detailed the letters are taken seriously uh, so selecting the right mentors and getting the right letters is really critical but these are easy things to do because you know i mean if you spend some time you can actually help yourself uh, there are other collaborators also which are also were also included in that um, collaborators may be local um, at other places they may have large data sets that you will collaborate with for example or you can go spend some time working with them uh, again the details of the work uh, are important one thing to stress is that people often have one mentor three co-mentors and four collaborators reviewer then say how are you going to do all this who is really in charge so you need to show how the mentors will communicate among themselves so the primary mentor is in charge so that mentor will make sure that the other mentors co-mentors work with you collaborators work with you and your project gets done and lastly the environment um, you need institutional uh, commitment you need a letter from the chair of the department who says that this person will have an appointment as an assistant professor in the department uh, we will not give any teaching or academic or clinical or other work that takes more than 25% of the time and for that time the person will be paid uh, those letters again are looked at very seriously uh, and if there is any discrepancy between the letter and what your project says for example your project says they will recruit 50 people and the letter says 25 people the reviewers will say actually there is really no communication so make sure that any changes you make in the project are reflected in those letters so this is my last slide I, I really love the awards uh, for junior investigator one because you don't compete with senior folks when you write an R01 it doesn't matter whether you are junior or senior uh, you will be competing with seniors who have 200 publications here that's not the case secondly again it's really amazing maybe if you five years of funding for just going to the library taking courses learning new things I don't think there is any other field uh, in which uh, this happens the chair gives you a written commitment which is impossible these days no chair will say that come and I will give you 75% salary support nobody has that kind of hard money to give and this is coming from NIH and then the chair I think it's great for people, young people especially those uh, raising young families because uh, if uh, for whatever reason you want to take three weeks off or um, whatever purpose you can do that you can do the work at home you are not clinically or otherwise responsible and make sure you don't take yourself you take on uh, administrative responsibility which you don't need to uh, so I really think KWARTs are really terrific and there is a lot of expertise here to give out there great, great. Uh, what if there is some comments uh, questions call a program officer do you just are there used to make people calling and just saying here's my idea here's what I'm writing a grant about um, what are your thoughts or what is your sort of goal in speaking with the NIH program officer talking to the program officer uh, in some way you should have a good relationship with the program officer just like Gary was saying with the industry people it's really important that you sometimes it's hard the program officer their personality is very but you can find out who is the right person and then get more information about that person before you call most of the program officers one can, thing I can tell you that typically they are PhD most of them and they often have done some research before they join NIH they are very proud of what they did but nobody cares about that so get that information beforehand and when you start talking you can say oh I understand that you did some electrophysiology before you joined NIH and the, the person says face beams are gosh I mean how did you know about that uh, once you get them on your side then you can say you know send your CV to them 
say, you know, I'm thinking about that, what do you think? Will this work, will this not work? Uh, can I send you a proposal, uh, get their comments? Um, when you go to, I think you should make an attempt to go to Washington, just set up an appointment, go meet with that person. Most of them get very little positive feedback from outsiders. Uh, and anything like that you can do, I think, will, be, will increase the chances of their giving you something back. Yeah, they, Obviously, they don't decide who gets funded, but they can actually make a huge difference. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So they, you know, they don't score the grants or anything like that, but, but a program officer that you have a good relationship with you can be your champion, and that's important when assigning to study sections or if, if you barely make the cut, sometimes they can... They, Program officers have the, the right to pull some grants out uh, out of order. There's all kinds of things that they can do if they if they feel that you are, uh, you know, someone that they should be uh, they should be investing in. I, I had a question for you because you said that you should be presenting your data and even publishing your data before the grant. That's an interesting issue that comes up: is how much preliminary data do you have? And once you publish it, it doesn't really fit into preliminary data anymore. I can tell you what I do is I like to have one paper's worth of preliminary data in a grant that I hold back and don't publish until the grant goes in. Because if I publish it, then I can't say, ah, look at all this new stuff I'm doing. For a, I, 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 I see your point and I agree with you. For a K award though, I think it is useful to have a publication in the area because that shows with an RO1 coming from a senior investigator, feasibility is not uh, an issue. But for uh, key awardee, one of the issues is can the person really do the study in the environment that he or she is in, working with the mentor that I mentioned. And I personally think it's a good idea to have something. It can be a small study. It can be even case series or some small pilot study. I'm not talking about some definitive study published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. But something small, to even a two-page brief report. Uh, but also because I like the reviewers' comments that come and that say that this thing you did was wrong or do this different statistic. That helps improve the proposal that you write. I think it's a great point. Now, I'm sure you're going to talk about more about the keep it simple part. Because that, the natural tendency is to try to impress reviewers with how much you know about something. And the, the best grants are ones that are really dumbed down so that anybody who's not an expert in the field can get it. And, and also that the experiments are, again, simple. Each one answers a question. And, uh, and, and when it's, it's not a mystery novel like you're trying to spring something on someone at the end. You want someone to just see such a compelling story that uh, that they're going to pay you to do what you want to do anyway. But keeping it simple is essential. It shouldn't be like stereo instructions, which is sort of like... But I think this point you mentioned, a story, that's really a good point. I mean, anything you write, there should be a story. And it should, the, the ideal K written is, so it makes you feel that you are born to do that kind of work. And you make it, so I call it retrospective falsification, but you arrange your biography as if you are born to do that. Exaggerating. But really, you make a story that you started out this way, you really got interested, then you found this, wow, and then you ended up in this place, and you found this mentor, now you are going to do this study, and you are adding these new elements to your resume that you don't have through the K award, and how that will really be fit. Something like that becomes powerful. I have a question about um, waiting to apply for a K until you've gotten yourself a nice little publication cushion. Um, how do you explain the time that lapses in between? Um, I've, I've known some folks that have, have been doing research for eight years and they apply for their first K and their criticism is, why are you applying for a K at this point? You know, you've been mentored for eight years or whatnot. Um, so, so applying for a K and then applying for an R01? Is that right? Oh, oh, did you mean R01 when you said that? Sorry. No. I no. didn't mean K. Oh. So K99 typically would be, so you would apply for an R01 within a year or two. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, typically you won't do that till the fourth year K. Mm -hmm. 
you can probably apply for an R21 or R34 earlier. But you're, you're worried about that, that dead space between your yeah, fellowship, yeah, your yeah. fellowship oh. and, yeah, yeah. and, yeah. and, and um, yeah, you got to pick the right time. If you wait too mm -hmm. long, You've waited too long. <laughs> so, it's hard to say. So I, I mean, I don't, I, having reviewed, at least in my area, re reviewing the K awards, there's not a lot of them that have double digit publications. you got to have something in their hand to do that. But if you do wait too long, then they say, well, write an R01, you're, yeah. you're done. <laughs> so it's, it, again, it's part of, of what Dillard was saying about telling a story about what you've been doing. Uh, it is really boring. Um, I want to be the greatest this, that, that. Where does that come from? How did you, what have you been doing? Clearly, if you've, if you've been out of fellowship um, four years, um, well, maybe you've been doing something that, that needs to be explained uh, in the narrative. How you got into this area, what your clinical experience was, what your mentoring was, that made this K grant an interesting option for your development. Actually, I'd like to pick up on, on one of your slides, the career plan slide, because I think a lot of people uh, don't get it, and a lot of mentors don't get it either. Uh, we're old, we write R01, we write R grants. Uh, the, the, the institutes are looking for some specific things in these uh, uh, in, in the career plan section, and um, the uh, you really need to consult with some other people in the university who have a lot of experience with K grants because you might inadvertently be leaving something out. The, the first thing I wanted to, to mention is that there are a surprising number of resources available on the web. Lots and lots and lots of resources are out, um, including uh, from NIH itself. Uh, going to NIH.gov and clicking on the grants and funding tab will reveal all sorts of really interesting and helpful uh, uh, links, documents. Uh, going to the csr.nih.gov site, again, looking at application, uh, applicant resources tab, is very helpful. Uh, the nih.gov uh, site allows you to sign up for the funding opportunities. It's reasonable, reasonable indeed to just keep aware of what's going on. If you're not aware, you sometimes waste a lot of time. We, we were talking uh, a couple of weeks ago that many of the institutes, for instance, are euthanizing the R21 programs. And uh, unless you're getting those announcements, you might be merrily preparing your R21 grant uh, only to find out that that doesn't exist anymore. Some of the institutes still have them, for instance. Some don't. Again, talking with a program officer, this is a recurring theme, uh, would, would help. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is the distinction between announcements, RFAs, and RFPs. How to say this? Announcements are things that are everyone say would agree these are important, good things to do. Just because there's an announcement in your area doesn't mean anything. That just that that your grant will then have a higher chance of getting funded. It still has to run the gauntlet of the study section. It still has to compete with many other meritorious things. Maybe if you're one percentile away, um, that announcement pitch uh, might be helpful. Uh, and again, I'm talking about R01, I'm not talking about centrographs. Uh, similarly, <coughs> you'll uh, 
you'll see things about RFAs and RFPs. Uh, just so I know, do you all know the distinction between announcement and RFA and an RFP? RFA and an RFP is very different from an announcement. There, the Institute is saying, by golly, I am going to fund five RO1s come hell or high water if they're in this special area. Now, that's advantageous, except that everybody else sees that their NIH is vowed to do this. So it gets to be a little bit of a game about what you think your chances are uh, of having an unsolicited R01 that gets percentiled uh, or, or a special RFA uh, response. The, um, sometimes it's more advantageous and there's no way of predicting it. I mean obviously if the uh, RFA only has uh, 20 applications and they're going to fund five, well in today's funding environment really advantageous to go for that. You have no way of knowing that. Uh, on the other hand, obviously if it comes in and it fits you to a T, you should go for it. RFA versus RFP. Well, RFA is a, re it's a grant and, a, and an RFP is a contract. And the difference between a grant and a contract is that a grant says it is very worthwhile to drive from San Diego to Los Angeles for the following reasons, and this is how I want to do it. An RFP says the same thing, but God help you if you get off the freeway and try taking a different route. If you, if you take a different vehicle from what you said you were going to do, because it's a government contract, whereas a grant is general and is a little bit more flexible. If, if things change, if you want to use a different assay to do something, that's fine in an RFA. RFP is very, very narrowly defined about your discretion. So, um, point number two, that was resources from NIH. Uh, who can you talk to about what? And who can't you talk to? Uh, generally, there are three groups of people that immediately come to mind. The program officer, the review officer, and study <coughs> section reviewers. Do not talk to study section reviewers. Never talk to study section reviewers. You can only cause them dyspepsia. Uh, uh, you make them anxious. They don't know. They don't necessarily know what the vote was um, uh, around the table. They put yourself in their shoes. Um, it's just uncomfortable, uh, and you'll see them at meetings. Uh, you'll bump into them all, all the time. Um, it's not. It's not profitable to have that discussion. On the other hand, the one person you should talk to is your program officer. He or she is a cheerleader for your area of science. You should go out of your way to meet that person. And this is a familiar theme. So this was prepared in advance, so I'm not uh, just imitating our, our previous illustrious uh, speakers. So you should talk to the program officer. You should uh, take, an take advantage of your next trip to Washington. Try to schedule this. This is a pleasure for them. To meet somebody young, interested, that they don't know, is a good idea. You're making their day. You should probably do similar things with your department chair uh, about sharing, sharing an interest and not necessarily asking for money yet. Uh, uh, so you're, you're sh giving this program officer a sense of view for the future. And, and he or she will remember your visit and will be able to give you some advice. Um, the review officer is kind of the referee for the study section. Um, the review officer wants, above all, for things to be fair. And um, you can't really get into an awful lot with the review officer 
except in the nature of the review itself. So if you see that your grant has been assigned to study section X and you look at the CSR site and you discover that um, someone that you have a notorious relationship with, uh, that you suspect you might have a relationship with, that you're just uncomfortable, tell the, tell the executive secretary of the study section that you think so-and-so might be in conflict. And the, 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 the study section review officer will immediately make it so that that person is out of the room and not in, uh, uh, going to affect your uh, review of your application. Another thing that the program officer can help you with is the selection of the study section itself. Most grants could arguably be fit in two or three study sections. A little theme and variation. You want to make sure it gets at least in the two or three study sections that are reasonably close. And you want to make darn sure that it doesn't get misaligned, misassigned uh, to something that's too far away. How do you know something's close? Well, you can read the CSR website. That's helpful. Um, a shortcut is to look at the membership of the study section and ask yourself whether you recognize any of those people. Are these people that you know from meetings, people whose papers you read? Chances are if there are um, three or four people in the study section that you recognize, it might be the right study section uh, for you. But this is a discussion that the program officer can help you with. Principle number four, budget preparation. You can write the science, but you can't write the budget. Now, the sorry thing is that the department and the university can't write the budget either. Uh, they certainly can't do it on time, and they can't do it without your help. So these things need to be interacting from the beginning. Uh, you know, you're going to be working on your narrative pretty much until 24 or 48 hours before the deadline. But you will need to have had the conversations with your departmental person about the budget. I always tried six weeks in advance. Because I always knew plus or minus one research assistant, plus or minus so much thousand dollars for an assay here or there. You, you need to know that and you need them to figure this out because the fringe benefit rates change all this and you need to hound them. They are busy. And um, uh, you have to make sure that you don't get lost uh, in, in the shuffle. Uh, and you need to know in a hurry. I mean, if, uh, if your budget is mounting up too much, then there are different considerations uh, in terms of the negotiations with NIH. NIH won't even receive a grant with a total direct cost more than 500000 a year unless they have agreed to receive it. Uh, so you need to know that uh, in a hurry uh, as you have this, dis as you're preparing your application. So is there a rule of thumb that we can follow as you, what percentage of the budget should go to salary support versus the actual research cost? I know it varies depending on the type of brand, but I mean, sometimes I feel like if the budget is heavily weighted towards paying people, then Okay, so um, first, first let me answer that, and then, and then I want to make a little tangent. Uh, the bulk of our expenses are personnel. Can't help it. Uh, the the uh, you need to carve out enough of your of your time so you can do this project. Um, 
and you need a staff to, to help you. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's a, a rule of thumb that way. There are some uh, reviewers who will, will ask the question from a very jaundiced point of view, okay, how much is this costing per subject? So if you're if you're saying you're two hundred thousand dollars a year and it's a, a five-year grant, a million dollars, and and you're going to have hundred subjects, is is this? It's a different way of, of kind of viewing things. So there there is a bottom line consideration that some reviewers will will adopt. When I said I wanted to make a tangent, you asked, is there a rule of thumb? I think if you talk to people who've done lots of grants, we all have our opinions. But the, the randomness of things is extensive. So I think we all know what a bad grant looks like, what a bad budget looks like. It's hard, though, to really predict, because every time that study section meets in a small group, something happens. And, uh, and I've seen it too many times. It's, it's just very interesting. The, uh, so uh, I think the, one of the things that's important is your budget justification. There are all these forms for the exact line item, but the budget justification itself is really important. And this is one of the few places where you are not limited uh, in terms of page limit. Uh, so many people, here's your chance to explain why you want this expensive piece of uh, equipment uh, and uh, how it fits in. The, uh, as a uh, afterthought, upbeat after, afterthought, post-award, so you got the grant, time to really pay attention to the budget. The same people who didn't give you your budget on time as you were fighting the deadline for your grant application are going to be the same people who don't give you your monthly budget, budget statements. And you absolutely have to track that any way you can. Uh, I could tell you all sorts of things that on an occasion, a uh, different occasion, about uh, the problems that come up uh, with departments or in many universities. You need to be, you're an individual entrepreneur, you're a businessman. This is your budget. Uh, so what are the keys to a successful narrative? And again, these are common themes that all of us are talking about. Tell a story with clarity and verve. Clarity. So we talked about that a couple sessions ago about all of, the, all of the, the, the ways that we can try to shape our writing style so it's clear and communicative. One of the things in a grant that's necessary is a repetition. Really experienced grant writers will repeat as they go from one chapter in the grant to the next. There'll be a one paragraph repetition uh, of what, what's the big picture, Again, how are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Really important. It's awful. If you're a reviewer, you are assigned many, many grants, and you're doing the best you can. You've got to make it very reviewer friendly. You do that in a graphic presentation of your grant. Do not give a grant that is solely text. Your reviewers are by definition older and presbyopic already. And uh, they want a figure. Everybody loves a figure. Everybody loves a table. And if you're going to do a figure, for heaven's sakes, have the font size so it is readable. Just, just oh, well, that's a pretty bar. I don't know what it shows, but it's pretty. Um, is not going to be helpful. Um, I think. Other keys to a successful narrative are a mechanistic focus. Uh, and that is that, um, that there's really nothing wrong with looking for associations, but reviewers rarely get enthusiastic uh, 
They want a mechanism. This acts here how, and this is what the implications of that would be. Um, Even if it's completely hypothetical, so just a, like a proposed model or... Is that what you're talking about? Because uh, if I you think, don't really know what the association is, you can just... You're, you're going to propose and test a model. Yeah. So, in, in uh, the real nuts and bolts of the grant, page one of the grant is the page to obsess about. The aims and hypotheses. If they're not right, all is lost. Uh, uh, you know, and this is something that you need to spend a lot of time with. It's, uh, uh, it's useful, again, to start with a, a one paragraph crazy. Uh, again, this is, this is the, the first iteration. Uh, uh, you're going to do this as you go through it. So what's the big picture? Why is this important? And here are my aims and hypotheses. Consider um, a schematic drawing, some mechanistic focus uh, drawing. Uh, don't have a gazillion arrows in it, because the, the statistician in, in the study section will just uh, turn livid uh, when, when, when you have too many arrows, uh, justifiably. Uh, but what are, what are some conceptual links? How are you, how are you proposing this all fits together? Uh, one page. That one page is, is worth half a million dollars, so get it right. Uh, uh, if you don't get that right, you might as well skip the rest. Um, significance, the, frankly, I think this is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. This is my personal view. I mean, you know, unless you're studying something horribly obscure, just write one paragraph, two paragraphs, reference three or four papers, and get on with it. You do not need to argue and persuade people that cardiovascular disease is a major health problem or that breast cancer is bad. Um, a lot of people spend a lot of time with that section, with that section, and that's probably a waste of your time. The innovation section is relatively new, and, and I guess those of you who are growing up in the system, this will be easier for you. It becomes a little uh, awkward uh, uh, for for those of us who were under the old system, but the innovation is really important. Uh, and you've got to use all your writing style to make sure that this comes across clearly. Use your fonts, use your bulleting, format it so that if there are two or three clearly innovative points to your application, that they stand out because the reviewer is going to be looking for them. And uh, the reviewer ultimately, uh, particularly if the reviewer likes it, He's, he or she's going to want to come back to that and say <coughs> the, the applicant points out these uh, important areas of innovation. Uh, the approach. I think the last session we talked about this, that, that uh, people who have done studies of reviewer behavior find that the approach is what's weighted more heavily than anything else. Environment. Uh, you know, you're not uh, working in a yurt somewhere, but most of the time, uh, you know, we all have a decent environment. This is a little different for a K, a K grant, but in our, uh, you don't need to spend a lot of time on the environment section. But the approach, you absolutely do. And again, you're going to start with an overview. You want to make it absolutely user-friendly. A, 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 a table that lists the acronyms, is helpful as the reviewer can't remember because this is the fifth grant. They're, they're reading on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I kind of sketched in, in the handout, common areas that people want to cover in the approach. I, I did want to emphasize one thing, that if you're in an area that is likely sensitive from a human subject's point of view, it is worth your while to denote that both in the methods approach section 
as well as in the human subjects uh, section of the grant. You want to make sure the reviewer is uh, comfortable and aware that you're thinking about it. You can highlight something in the approach section and then say, for details, please see the human subjects area. Finally, uh, do share your, your drafts. Do send them around. Send them around to people uh, who are close to the area. Send them around to people who are not close to the area. Uh, you need input. Uh, any input is helpful. Uh, input that says, I didn't follow this. Uh, this is a crappy sentence. Uh, what's the logic? I'll go here, there. Why did you do design it this way as opposed to that way? This stuff is really helpful. And you should be sending it out. People differ in their rapidity of review. Uh, some people will look at it once. Some people can look at it multiple times. Uh, and we've all seen drafts. So um, just label a draft. And if you're embarrassed about a draft, say, you know, I know this is missing, but I, I'm going to be working on this, but I wanted to get this to you soon enough so uh, you could get me uh, your opinion. So, um, let me pause and, and see if there are other questions. Where yes. do you put the preliminary data, now that there's no section labeled preliminary data? <laughs> yeah, it's um, actually, uh, I've got it listed here under, under uh, Roman numeral 9. I think most people, the approach section no. kind of is a little bit of a melange of methods and preliminary data. And again, it's tricky. How much preliminary data do you include? How much does it look like you've done it all? And, uh, all of us are kind of writing grants that are maybe we've done 10%, 20% of it already. I mean, this is typical. Um, but um, the um, again, you want, to, you want to show some figures that are readable want to show some publication track record or that you've presented this various national meetings. Other questions? What would be a good example of a benchmark for success? Okay. Um, uh, again, you might want to do things like what's your what's your recruitment rate? When what do you expect to have accomplished by um, in, in the first three months of the grant. Well, in the first three months of the grant, presumably you, you will have hired and trained um, your staff. You will have acquired equipment. So it's uh, a timeline table? I'm sorry? Like a timeline table? Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Uh, what the recruitment will be uh, 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 in a clinical study. Uh, if you've got a DSMB, when will your DSMB be? Uh, convened, um, you know, something that shows that you're you're kind of thinking down the road, and that's actually important. Uh, it, it it gets a little more comfortable after you've done this uh, uh, a lot of grants, but but you do need to be thinking ahead. It's like writing a computer program. You uh, you always start the computer program with the last step, and then you work back. In order to be there that last step, where did I have to be just before that? And, and so you, you have to think about that. If, if my grant is a five-year grant, where do I want to be by, by the end of the fifth year? What do I, what I have to have done? Um, that, those sorts of things. There's a, a, a technique I alluded to it before. They're called Gantt charts. They're, they're just timeline charts. There are any number of, uh, of these charts which are available. Uh, on the internet, uh, they're actually they're, they're useful uh, representations of the timeline. How much time do you, or how much of your grant space do you take up with this section on troubleshooting or your plan B if experiment A doesn't work? Um, you know that section where they want to know what you're going to do if it doesn't turn out the way you planned it to. Well, what's your next? I forget what it's called, but yeah, you know. I, I think it's. I don't think there is a number on that, but um, but I think it's very comforting to a reviewer 
to see that you're thinking. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought about this approach. Uh, I chose this approach for the following reasons, but I did consider that. Yeah, uh, like your anticipated result and anticipated. Yeah, problems. and you can you can weave that in to a certain extent into the the text as it comes up, uh, and then at the, that last um, section, the kind of alternative uh, approaches and limitations, benchmarks, uh, you, I guess, need to communicate the fact that when all is said and done, something of great value will have uh, accumulated. How, how would you guys deal with that? Well, I, I spread it throughout. I mean, the way I organize grants is uh, <laughs> what I call the Jeopardy format. Every section is framed in the, as a question. So that forces me to answer the question with every experiment that I propose. And then every section that goes underneath it is anticipated uh, results and pitfalls. And if you just want to know the, what's the ratio of the two, they're about equal. Usually, I, I don't go into a lot of detail on the experimental design where you can with 12 page format. It's not like the others. It was, Reviewers want to see is not just did you plan the experiment and they don't want to know the phosphate buffer concentration. They want to know if this doesn't work, what do you think is going to happen? If it doesn't work, what are you going to do next? And if it does work, does this open up another area? So you may say, you may say in your experiments, well, I'm going to do, uh, you know, EMSAs. Uh, and, and then in the anticipated result and so on, you say, well, if this works, I'm going to think, of, I, I will consider doing chip assays to confirm it. But that way you're not committing yourself to something in the actual experiment. It, it, it's tricky. It's, yeah. it is, I, it's really You have to have the right balance of sort of having something very simple, but having the reviewer know that you've thought about other things, that, the things that can go wrong and what you'll do if they go wrong. The, the other thing that has been popping up in a lot of grant reviews that I've seen, not just in mine, but in others, is for bench science, uh, a translation plan. It, I, I have seen several grants get dinged, not because the science isn't great, but because there is no translation plan in there. So you, you actually have to explicitly have... Say, like how it applies to a... Well, so let's say you're looking at a target. Are, are you going to do high throughput screening? Are you going to... What, what are you going to do to turn your validated target into a therapeutic? Now, personally, I don't think that's a great thing for people to be doing in these grants. But I've seen a number mm -hmm. of critiques come back now from my colleagues uh, where it says that. I'm on council now for my institute, and I, when I look at the critiques I'm seeing, actually what I think is a, <coughs> is a bad trend, where even though even I'm a translational guy, not every science project has to lead to a drug. Sometimes and you want to learn more about the science. T1 type and T2 type of translational research. And, and in, in effect, what you're saying, one of the biggest challenges I'm facing designing the aims is that they really, I was told, that they shouldn't depend on the success of the prior aim. Each individual aim really should be independent and its own right and bring you know, outcomes that could benefit the community. Well, that's However, a pretty good rule of thumb, by the way. And the worst way to write a grant is to say, is, is to write it so that if the first experiment doesn't work, you're done. Right. But However, when you want to design something that takes what you find in the human population and then assess the mechanics that functions in a lab based on your association in the first aim, you basically have to depend on your <laughs> your finding in the first aim to design the appropriate experiments. You can talk about the different options you're going to use depending on the findings, but you can't know what the findings are until after you do the first aim. So that's, but that's where preliminary data is critical. You, you need to have enough preliminary data that you've made a compelling argument that this can't fail. So let's, let's also talk a little bit about what happens after you've submitted the grant. Uh, first thing you should do is to go out for dinner 
uh, with whoever's near and dear to you and celebrate uh, because just getting a grant out of the university is, I would say, almost as arduous as getting a grant favorably reviewed by a study session. It is hard, it is hard work. There's a lot of administrative work which just requires horrible attention to detail. And that's what, it's that way everywhere. So celebrate. Uh, you uh, should be checking in commons uh, a couple weeks later. Uh, you'll see that it got there right away. But uh, you should be checking the commons to make sure it got assigned to the right study section. And if it got assigned and misassigned to the wrong study section, then you call up. CSR, and they'll pull it and get it reassigned. It won't hurt you at all. Um, you'll note when the review uh, will take place. Uh, it's amazing now how rapidly the reviews, uh, the scores are available. It's just unbelievable. I mean, they'll, they'll be on the commons within two or three days. Maybe not the percentile, but the score will be. Uh, How long a lot does that of people, process take from the time you... If, you, if you've got a grant that's going in for October 1 uh, deadline, it would be reviewed in February or March. And um, the, uh, you know, the first, first month is trying to just get it to the right niche, the right study section, and getting out, and, all that, but it'll be There's reviewed thousands, in February. Thousands of them. Yeah, it's a whole, whole warehouse. <laughs> um, fe February or March, you should be able to go to Commons and see two or three days afterwards um, what the score was. Some people are afraid to look. Um, mm -hmm. so, it's uh, like this. <laughs> <laughs> Very nerve-wracking time. You used to have to wait six weeks or eight yeah. weeks for a pink sheet to yeah. show up. And then, and then the pink, the, the pink sheet. Ah, the pink sheet's no longer pink. <laughs> was that used to be? Used to be. Used to be. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 were pink. Pink. they were on pink paper. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 real uh, reviews may take uh, another week or two before before they're posted. But you want to know quickly, because, uh, you know, if, if your grant was triaged, okay, well, that means that you are going to have to wait until you get the reviews to sort it through. If the grant got a score, you're going to need to talk to your program officer and, and help figure out what this score really means. Uh, but even if it's triaged, you only find out in February or March. No, they, they won't even make up their mind about triaging except until the date of the study section meeting. So they're not going to, it's not like a, a journal submission um, that an editor will triage it out. Uh, NIH is very uncomfortable making decisions. They want, the, they want us in peer review land to make decisions. So all their job is to try to pick good reviewers who can review fairly. And uh, those reviews, uh, are not even going to be in until a week before study section. Uh, so, but and it may be sometimes the two reviewers say one reviewer liked it a lot, two didn't. Then there would be a quick discussion, and the first reviewer is convinced that his point is really other two reviewers. Then they won't discuss it. Although, so that's why the reaction won't occur until the study section meets. Now, with, if you are, and we, we'll need to stop uh, momentarily, but if, if you are lucky enough to have uh, to, uh, a grant that got reviewed uh, but didn't get funded, you will be given the opportunity to submit one um, revision or amended application together with one page of an introduction. That one page of introduction is the most important page because that's the rebuttal tactfully for acknowledging how the new application, amended application, has responded to the review. Uh, 
Everything else is going to be more or less the same. If you got that far, it meant that they really kind of like this a lot. So the, your whole grant's not under fire. You don't have to amend certain sections, but that one-page introduction is enormously important. And then it goes back to the same group to review. It goes back to the same group, but there may be different people in the group. Okay? I might have rotated off. Gary might have come on. And you don't know. So different reviewers? It tends to, usually at least one of the former reviewers will be reviewing the, the, the amended application as well. But each time it's a, it's a bit of a yeah. If, if there are three reviewers, at least one of them is likely to be a new person. Yeah. And that's very unfair sometimes as a investigator you feel because the issues that were not raised are now raised. Well, there's something yet, of an unwritten rule that some not everybody pays attention to that if if you address if you address a former uh, reviewer's critiques and you're the new reviewer that you get credit for that you still have to review it de novo but but you have to give someone credit for answering the critique that they had at hand in, in, in their hands so so with that uh, uh, grant writing is challenging Use your mentors. Uh, put a lot of time into it. Uh, only do this if you have a passion uh, for this. Uh, it's wonderful, wonderful to be given the opportunity to pursue uh, to pursue a, a grant opportunity, a research opportunity. But only do this if it, if you really love it. Uh, don't don't write a grant even if you kind of think, well, gee, this could get funded. Boring. Don't do that. Do something that you really want to do. So, do you senior uh, establish investigators still um, ask your peers to review your grant for some Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think probably the older you get, the more people you ask. Uh, and, you, and you also learn who's really good to ask. Uh, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not helpful for somebody to say, Oh, Joel, I love, your, I love your work. It was really beautiful, really interesting. Well, that's nothing. You know, I can I can look in the mirror and get that. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I still send them out to three or four people at various times during the during the process, and I want people that are going to tell me what's wrong with it. Yeah. And I send it at different times also. You don't send it to say three four people at the same time. Send it to say two people, get their comments, revise it, then send to a again some fresh set of eyes at that point. Huh? But don't prep them though. See. You, you want it to be like a, uh, a mock jury, right? You, you, you don't say, read this, I'm not so sure about this section, would you tell me what you think of it? Wait, wait till they get their fresh eyes on it, give you back your critique, and then you can go back and you can say, you know, discuss it with them in order to try to see if they picked up some of the same things that you were worried about. Do you feel it's helpful to send it to someone who's not in your field? Um, it depends how far outside the field. I mean, I don't send a rheumatology grant to a neurosurgeon or something like that. But, but I mean, I, I send my grants, you know, on, on, you know, innate immunity to an integrate biologists or something like that. Because the people that are reviewing it are not going to necessarily be experts in, the, in, in your specific tiny area that you're focusing the grant on. One other thing along that I find useful is that. Suppose you are presenting the work and then somebody raises a question that, that totally seems dumb to you. The fact that somebody asks a question suggests that one of the reviewers may have the same question. So even though you could there in person, you could say, you know, you are dumb and that is the wrong question. That really doesn't help. It's useful to mention that in your write-up. And one thing that I have seen, you know, you know, I have the grant all ready to go, and just a day before somebody reads it, and he said, oh, gosh, I mean, this is totally wrong, you can't do that. So, the way to do that, actually, then respond to that, is not, not to submit the grant, but thinking about somebody has a question, you see, to give an example, actually, we had a center a grant sometime back, and then somebody, a really good friend of mine, he saw, and he said, he said, you won't be able to do all these things. So I wrote a paragraph, actually I added a paragraph, can we do all these things? Literally that was the title of the paragraph and said that you may, reviewers may question this, but why we think this is possible? 
So, th something to keep in mind when somebody asks you that the reviewers, some reviewer may have that question, right? Make sure that you respond to that. A good grant is a dance, a dance between you and the reviewer. You're respectful, you're a man.